1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. Father Brian Milady is in the house. If you've got a question for Father, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is uh, that number for you would be one two zero five. 271-2985, and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1205-271-2985. You can always send us an email. That email address is openline at ewtn.com. I'm Jack Williams, Michael McCall, producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Kubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can uh, type a question into the chat window, and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, as he is, every single Thursday, <clears throat> our very favorite Dominican father, Brian Milady. How are you? Just fine, thank you. How are you? Terrific. How's your Advent going? Well, wonderfully. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. Hopefully it'll finish up strong. Did you, yes. did you don any rose vestments on Sunday? Of course. All right. I very did. good. Yeah. Glad to, Glad to hear it. All right. Hope. It's all about hope. Right. Um, you're going to talk a little bit today about uh, an aspect of your order's motto that you just educated me on. <laughs> well, yeah, the motto of the Dominican order is to contemplate and to give to others the fruits of contemplation. But I chose this topic partially because of the Feast of St. John of the Cross recently, and also I think it very much relates to the whole Advent theme. You know, the prayer this morning talked about us loving heaven and using wise of the things of this earth. And loving heaven is basically what contemplation is about. The pagan philosophers even knew, for example, Aristotle again, in his work, The Nicomachean Ethics, after a number of long chapters about the nature of virtues, he says, well, why, are we, why do we develop virtues? Why do we need them? And he says, well, the primary reason is to prepare ourselves for the contemplation of divine truth. But he doesn't go any further into detail about this because since he doesn't know about grace and doesn't know about the Old Testament, he doesn't really know how to get to the contemplation of divine truth. And so he kind of goes away sad, like the fox before the grapes, who sees the grapes are delicious, but he can't reach them. Remember the old Aesop fable. Well, we can, and it's because Christ took flesh that we can. Christ is our conduit to contemplation of God and also to entering deeply into union with him even while on earth to prepare ourselves for heaven. The Christmas preface says, in him we see our God made visible and so are caught up in love of the God we cannot see. Contemplation is the subject matter, basically, of treatises on the spiritual life. And you will know it in the Second Vatican Council, they had a number called the Universal Call to Holiness, in the Lumen Gentium. The reason is because for four or five hundred years, following the Protestant Reformation, there had been a, a very strange idea that partially grew up in Catholicism, and it was a kind of Catholic version of Protestantism, and it's the heresy of Jansenism. And Jansenism was a very insidious heresy because it manifested itself as a strict observance return to religious purity. Now, those, it had good aspirations, obviously, but the trouble is that 
it basically suggested that there were two roads, two spiritualities. There was the laity, who were basically called only to virtue, and especially the active virtues. And then there were maybe contemplative religious and priests and bishops and maybe even some ordinary religious who were called to communion with God while on earth, which is basically what contemplation is. Now, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a movement to correct this impression because Jansenism was a very powerful heresy. It made its way to this country through French and Irish missionaries. And it became very powerful here, where people would feel unworthy even to go to communion. Well, if they did, that maybe they'd do it a couple times in their lifetimes. Basically, during Advent, what we're asked to do is to recall how Christ takes flesh in us. And obviously, he doesn't do it in the same way he does in his son, God and his son. But he, how he enters into our souls and transforms them. And in traditional terms, there are three levels of this transformation. There's spiritual childhood, spiritual teenagerhood, and spiritual adulthood. If it's true that grace makes us a participant in divine nature, then just as human nature has a childhood, teenagerhood, and adulthood, so does the spiritual life, spiritually unifying yourself with divine nature. There are fancy words for these three stages. The spiritual childhood is called the purgative way. And it's because once we begin to seek to root out our faults and grow in the virtues, which is basically what the foundation of contemplation is about, this is very painful for all of us because we have to look deeply at our own egotism and admit we've got it, first of all. But secondly, we've got to try to change it uh, with God's help. The second way, spiritual teenagerhood, is also called the illuminative way. John of the Cross and others uh, talked about the dark nights of the soul, but these weren't nights in the sense of an absence of divine presence or divine light. They were only an absence perceived by us because once we prepared our souls, then God began to elevate us in a supernatural way so that we're blinded by the light in a certain sense. And that's why it's called darkness. But the third way is spiritual maturity. It's also called the unit of way. Teresa of Avila compared to a marriage We've been having lots of bridegroom things during Advent because, of course, Christ is the, in a sense, you could say he's the bridegroom that marries his bride, the church. And it basically has to do with looking at the world from the point of view of eternity, the way God looks at the world, not the way man does. So how do we grow in all these things? Well, first of all, we have to want to. And secondly, we have to be patient with all the various stages that any love relationship, even if it's marriage or even friendship in a way on this earth, goes through. And at the same time realize that what we're experiencing is this divine union. So during Advent and in preparation for Christmas, it is most important that we see the contemplative life not as a reserve for just a few chosen souls. Rather, because all of us were baptized into sanctifying grace, what took place, what was reflected in the soul of Christ, should also be reflected in our souls. And there aren't two ways to the Lord, perfect and imperfect. There's only one, and that's the way of grace. 833-288-EWTN. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. If you happen to be outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is one 205 
271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1205-271-2985. And you can always send us an email. That email address, once again, is openline at EWTN.com. That's openline, all one word, at EWTN.com. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Milady. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I don't like looking back. I prefer to look forward and keep moving forward. There's plenty to cover. I do a lot of research and try to dig out the bits and pieces of a life or of an agenda that people don't want to talk about. The World Over with Raymond Arroyo. Tonight, 8 Eastern, on EWTN Radio and Television. Join Archbishop Jose Gomez in sharing the good news. The coming of Jesus Christ is the greatest event in human history. It changes the world, and it changes every human life. But God prepares this great event in the quiet lives of ordinary people. Not with a great announcement, but with normal reality of a baby who is going to be born. God works in mysterious and hidden ways, through the small, through the weak, through those who seem insignificant in the eyes of the world. God wants to work through each one of us, through our ordinary lives. Visit lacatholics.org to find ways to connect with our faith community in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, in the days that are leading up to uh, the celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus. We'd like to help bring you closer to the infant Jesus and his blessed mother. We'd like to invite you to sign up to receive weekly emails from Father Joseph Mary Wolf, Advent and Christmas Reflections. In addition, we'd like to send you a beautiful free, free ebook, including all of our reflections, all of the reflections that Father Joseph will be offering during those times. You can simply visit EWTN.com slash Advent today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. Catherine called in from the great state of Oregon, and she couldn't hold on, but she wants to know if any religions other than Catholicism have saints. Well, if you mean Protestant religions, yes, of course, they have saints. But they're all Catholic saints, or they're scriptural saints. Maybe not in exactly the same way we do, but it depends on where they came from and what their history was. Also, of course, the Orthodox have saints, many more than we do in a way. They have a lot of Old Testament saints, like St. Adam and things like that. Um, No, I don't really think so, no. The whole idea of a saint is just someone who lives the Christian life in a very, very powerful way. What what about this notion, some of our evangelical brothers and sisters, some sects will have... Uh, they'll they'll use terminology of saints for the for the faithful here on earth. Oh, you mean like the Mormons come come ye saints, no toil and labor share. <laughs> well, yeah, but but they they use that because it's a word found in Scripture. It doesn't mean the same thing as it does in a Catholic sense. Uh, and of course, Saint Paul does refer to the saints, mm-hmm. meaning everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, we 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 refer to it more as people who are especially evident on earth in living the Christian life. 
So I guess if you thought that everybody was that way, I mean, certainly the Puritans and the Baptists wanted people to be that way. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that they came up to their ideals totally. But um, then in that sense you could say that. But again, those are Christian religions. Uh, or at least they're related to Christianity. Mormonism really isn't a Christian religion because it doesn't believe Jesus is divine. Or not divine in any different sense than us. But... Um, the, they do have a Christian roots, though, obviously, because they were a cult, basically, rooted in Christianity originally. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. Uh, Drew writes in, if God is the first effect... How is it that evil entered the world if there was only good before him? Did he say God is the first effect with an E? That's right. No, God's not an effect. God's a cause. <laughs> God's a cause. He's not an effect. Creation's the effect. And the reason creation can experience evil is because it's not God. So it's, it's not... Uh, guaranteed that it will produce good. Uh, it may, and also, in a physical evil sense, which really is a moral evil, what's good for one thing is bad for another. So the lambs is, is, is good for the, um, you, you know, for the lamb, but the, lion, or the lion's existence is good for itself, but bad for the lamb, because lions eat lambs <laughs> in order to get maintain their goodness, which is their survival. But uh, no, no, God is not an effect. I don't know who, who gave that terminology to the person who was asking it. God's a cause. He's the first cause. He's a cause that's not the effect of anything else. Otherwise, he would not be God. Yeah, he may have misspoke in his uh, yeah. his wording of the email. Uh, 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. First up today is Katie, a first-time caller in Dallas, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Katie, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Brian. Thank you. Um, so I had, it's kind of related to evangelization. My sister, who's non-Catholic, was asking like kind of the moral theology behind um, priests not being mandatory reporters if a sex abuser or child predator were to come into the confessional. Um, and so she was wondering where the moral line is, like does the priest have an obligation to um, the child to report it to the authorities? I said it was a little more complicated than that. that there's, it's not yes. just somebody coming into the confessional, but I was wondering if you can... Give some insight on that. Well, I think you spoke rightly about that. The, the priest can't warn anybody. He can't act on any knowledge he gains in the confessional for any purpose. He can encourage, for example, the person to act, but he can't do anything because... This is very hard for people to understand for some reason. The words that are spoken to the priest in confession are not spoken to him. They're spoken directly to Christ. The priest is merely the conduit. So since the words are not spoken to him, he has no right to share them with anybody else for any reason. That's part of the seal. Even if he were to be killed, even if he were to be accused himself. Uh, I highly recommend a film to you if you haven't seen this film. It was made in the 1940s by Alfred Hitchcock, and it's called I Confess with Montgomery Clift. And it's about a priest to whom someone goes to confession who's committed a murder, and the priest himself becomes implicated as the murderer, but he can't say anything. And they ask him direct questions, the prosecutor, and he refuses to answer. And so, of course, they interpret that as him being guilty. And uh, I won't tell you how it ends, because it's Hitchcock always likes his surprise endings. But uh, he, he can't say anything about it. 
because it isn't said to him. It's not entrusted to him as a person. He can, uh, it's, it's very hard sometimes for people to understand this, but it's, um, I'm just there, you know. I, I don't, <laughs> the person obviously wouldn't come in the confessional to talk to me. They come in the confessional to talk to him. So that's why we're not allowed to, to do that, even, even to save someone else. They used to have these unbelievable moral theology cases. They'd ask you, and one of the principal, they wanted to see what you'd answer. So one of the principal ones was someone comes to confession and tells you they poisoned the altar wine you're going to use for Mass. Do you still have an obligation to say the Mass or not? Or can you omit to do so? Because you can't reveal or act upon things that are said to you in confession. Well, one ingenious priest we had, his solution was, well, if they would still want you to drink the wine, but it's poisoned, um, obviously they're not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore it really isn't a confession, so therefore you don't have to. But I mean, there are various, a lot of those things were presented to people to see the reason they'd use, and there isn't necessarily a canonically correct answer, except for the fact that you can't reveal what's said to you in confession. That's the principle. Does that get you a little further down the road, Katie? It does. Thank you so much, Father. Sure. sure. 833-288-EWTN. It's a free telephone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. Um, Kathy writes in, Father, she says, Why did John the Baptist send two of his disciples to Jesus to ask if they were following the right man? Well, part of it was so Jesus could reveal, not necessarily John the Baptist, but to everybody else, that he was the Messiah using the prophecies. Remember, he doesn't say yes or no. <laughs> he says, go and tell John what you see and hear. And then he quotes Isaiah, which is the prophecy of who the Messiah will be or what he will do. So in other words, John the Baptist is drawing out our Lord in order to get him to reveal himself more fully to other people. Um, he could tell them that he was the Messiah, but everybody said, well, who are you? What does he say for, have to say for himself? So he gets the, uh, our Lord to make some, a statement. Now, it's true, it's an ambiguous statement. But it calls forth faith in our part. But it's, it, any, I believe, I would think, I would think that anyone who'd looked for the Messiah and was familiar with Isaiah would immediately identify that Jesus was saying he was the Messiah. 833-288-EWTN. That's our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. Um, a little follow-up to, to Katie's question earlier. Grant would actually like to know, why do we need confession? Well, we need confession for two reasons. First of all, because it's extremely helpful to have another person to whom we can say our weaknesses. Um, the famous psychiatrist Carl Jung, who was not Catholic, used to say in the 19th century that Catholics suffered less from neurotic psychiatric issues than Protestants did. And one of the reasons was because they had someone to talk to concerning their inter inner moral behavior and soul. The second reason is, well, uh, well, three actually. The second is our Lord instituted it. <laughs> so, and he instituted it for a reason because he knew, uh, though he called us to a very strict standard of life, that many of us were weak. So we need constant reaffirmation of this through forgiveness of the sins. 
And then the third reason actually is that um, we didn't just we we don't just have in Catholicism a Jesus and me relationship. Uh, all of our relationship with Christ in one way or another had to do with us being related to the church. So confession also allows us to place our sins before the church and the person of the priest and receive absolution. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Thursday with Father Brian Mullady. It's an EWTN radio tradition, the 48 hours of Christmas, all day, Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day. Special programs, music from around the world, and more. The 48 hours of Christmas, starting Christmas Eve morning only on EWTN radio. To ask, why should I pray, is the same as asking, why should I raise my mind and heart to God, since that's what prayer is. But when stated like that, it's pretty obvious. We need to pray because God is He to whom our minds and hearts are ultimately directed. Union with Him is our ultimate destiny. Without prayer, we lose our direction to God as our ultimate end, and thus set ourselves on a path that leads back into the slavery of sin. This is Father Lawrence Liu. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to the Blessed Virgin Mary, she who is the bearer of all life, Christ Jesus himself. And we ask the Blessed Mother to help us to be compassionate, to be courageous, but also to tell the truth as we strive and fight for an end to the evil of abortion, as we fight for the sanctity of all human life from conception till natural death. Lord, give us strength in this struggle in this time when we have to struggle against the civilization of death. Help us to build a new civilization based on your resurrection, one that will be filled with light and that will value life above all else. We ask this in your holy name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, this is Cy Kellett, host of Catholic Answers Live. Join us today for two hours of questions and answers about the Catholic faith. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now back to EWTN Open Line. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. A uh, big shout out to Burlington Divine Mercy Association at 98.3 FM in Burlington, Iowa. They're celebrating 19 years as an EWTN affiliate. Congratulations to Joe Spillane and his whole team wow. from your friends at EWTN Radio. A couple of open lines for you and still time for your calls at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. Next up is Evan. A first-time caller in Westland, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Evan, you are on with Father Brian Mullady. Hey, Father. Hey. Hey, my question is a follow-up to a previous email question. Um, uh, I think what the questioner was uh, asking, and I am wondering also, is if about the cause and effect. If God alone is perfect and there's nothing better, and God is in need of nothing, why would God create anything? Okay, um, because being infinite and eternal, God wants to share his life, his infinity, his eternity, insofar as other beings are unable to participate in it, by creation the world. And, and when I was a little boy, uh, we studied the catechism, Baltimore Catechism. And the first question was, who is God? And then the second question was, why did God make me? And the answer was, God made me to show forth his goodness and to make me happy with him in heaven. So in answer to your question about the universe in general, the first part of that is uh, important. 
Because good is diffusive of itself. Someone who's really good and infinitely good and perfectly good means they're also infinitely true and infinitely loving. And they want to share from love that goodness with other things. Well, in order for them to do that, those other things have to exist. And so God created the world as a fruit of divine love so that the world who, which came forth from God or the, in, in a more philosophical sense, if you're into that, uh, Thomas Aquinas would put it, as diversity came forth from unity, so diversity seeks and is attracted by nature to return to unity by a kind of dynamism. So in other words, when acorns fall from the trees, even, even though they, they, they're in a low-level sense, seeking to return to unity with the Creator. Uh, and that a desire to return to the unity with the Creator is made more and more interior depending on whether the being itself has more uh, intelligence and more self-consciousness and more freedom. So the least likely to return to unity are just two material objects, two stones. They have a unity or a dynamism like even by gravity, but one interferes with the other and it can't be fully realized. The next would be the plants. The plants synthesize various elements and there's destroy them to take them in and create cells. And then of course you have the animals who create even more um, unity from the diversity of the things that they experience. And then finally you have man who is able to unify himself with the whole world because he's able to know the infinite. But it's a knowledge that can only be fulfilled when man's soul is elevated through grace to experience true unity with the infinite. So it would be impossible for the universe to totally realize itself unless it could return to union with God through grace in man. And so that's why we're, we, you know, we, we stand in the middle of creation. There's a famous uh, quotation from a book of Neoplatonists in the middle a early Middle Ages. Man stands on the horizon of being in the middle of creation, between flesh and spirit, between time and eternity. All of time is synthesized in us, and we, unless we experience union with God, creation is frustrated. So um, we need grace. Otherwise, the whole of creation, as St. Paul says, is groaning and waiting to be set free and that includes our bodies, and this is a prelude for John Paul II to talk about what he calls the redemption of the body in his theology of the body. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Uh, we had an anonymous caller call in, and they said, I'm losing my faith and getting angry because God sent his son to die to end death and disease, but children are still abused and dying of cancer. Please explain this and help me get my faith back. All right. Um, look, um, disease is fairly easy to answer because disease has to do with a defect in a being that causes a defect in acting. And it basically comes from the fact that physical beings are not infinite. And so the microbe that's destructive to a cancer, let's say, it lives off us and the positive things in us. A, a powerful medicine, in a sense, does the same, only it helps to heal us. But when it comes to moral evils and people doing moral evils on each other, God only gives, in, is in no sense the cause of either of those, but in moral evils, it's 
defect in acting that causes the defect in being. So in other words, the real reason the will exists is to do good. If we use it because it's free to do wickedness to others, that's not God's fault. It can't be put up to him. That's our fault, and we need to admit it. If we admit it, then we save our souls. If we don't admit it, and we die in such a state, then nature and grace disagree, and we're personally forever frustrated in what we've done. Next up for us is Rockwall, Texas. Uh, Kevin is in the Republic of Texas, a first-time listener, answer, answer, answering how am I doing, listening on the Amazon Echo. Kevin, welcome to the program. You're on with Father Milady. Hi, Father Milady. How are you doing today? Okay. Um, my, my question is, uh, and I'm trying to stay out of the other rooms because I have you guys on my Echo things here. Um, I have a, I have a... A dilemma that because I am a Catholic, a baptized Catholic, my mom wasn't, you know, didn't raise us that way. My dad was, they were separated. But I can't try to have a belief as a, how come Catholics have a double standard towards masonry when the Shriner Hospitals and the Scottish Rite Hospital do so much? And if we support them, then how is that against church? Because that's 100% supported by Masonic masonry, which is 100% Christian with a Bible on the altar. And you can go to countries all over the world that are Catholic. And I just don't get that why is there such a huge deal against masonry in Catholicism? Well, uh, masonry is not Christian. It's only Christian in Christian countries. <laughs> It's Muslim and Muslim countries and Buddhist and Buddhist countries. And you don't really have to believe in anything exactly except a higher power. Also, it denies it's a deistic religion. In other words, it denies the divinity of Christ. I mean, it may hold that Christ was a nice moral teacher, or as Thomas Jefferson did, that Christ was a you know, good philosopher. But you remember Thomas Jefferson wrote a gospel in which he took out all the things that had to do with miracles and signs and all that and just made Jesus kind of a, well, what would you say, a good 18th century thinker who taught reasonable things, not a redeemer. See, that's the issue, not a redeemer, because we solve the problems ourselves. That's what the whole meaning of masonry is, the trowel and the whole thing. We solve the problems ourselves through better technology. It's an 18th century philosophy following the Enlightenment. Also, uh, well, the Enlightenment built lots of wonderful institutions, uh, but not very few of them were Christian as such. Now, they may have been in Christian countries, but as such, very few of them were interested in Christianity. And they solved all kinds of problems with diseases and all that business, which were all good things. But, they, but unlike the Freemasons, the Freemasons are anti-Catholic. The one church they had difficulty with was Catholicism because we maintain that Christianity is a unique religion, not just a nice religious philosophy, and we also maintain the supernatural origin of the church and the sacraments and how sacramentality is necessary in order for us to go to heaven. Well, the Masons, I, they don't talk that much about heaven because they really want to solve the problems here on earth. That's their point. Now, again, that doesn't mean they don't do wonderful things. I, in some ways, I'd much rather have a building built by a Mason than by a Catholic. <laughs> For some reason, the Catholic buildings tend to fall down. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there when it comes to judgments about religion. And it's true that there are countries like the United States where they're just presented as nice people who build swimming pools for poor kids or found hospitals. But you may recall it wasn't always that way. In the 1830s and 1840s, the know-nothings, they tried to take over the country and the government. And the United States had to resist them. All right? And in Latin America, 
They're definitely anti-Catholic. Calias and all those Mexican dictators, they were all Freemasons, the ones that hung the Catholics with the telephone poles, all Freemasons. So uh, please don't, don't canonize Freemasonry. I admit it's done some wonderful things, but on the other hand, when I was in Rome in the 80s, the Italian police had a huge, massive drug raid, and they found all the drugs in the basement of the Grande Loggia, the Grand Lodge in Palermo, which is, you know, is the Masonic Lodge. So uh, that's the reason Catholics can't be Masons, and we condemn Masonry. Be sure to check out The Miracle Hunter this Saturday, 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The guests are Raymond Arroyo, who's the author and host of The World Over, talking about his new book, The Wise Men Who Found Christmas, and Lorraine Bennett, author of The Little Way of Living with Less, inspired by St. Therese. That's The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill, Saturday, 1 and 7 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio. Next up is Alexis, a first-time caller in the great state of Florida, watching us on YouTube today. Alexis, thanks for holding. You're on with Father Milady. Hi, Father Milady. Thank you so much for your time. I wanted to know more about canon law and its significance and also what the best source to learn about uh, canon law would be. <laughs> well, I'm not a very good canonist, I'm afraid. You know, when I came along, there was no canon law exactly. It was between the Vatican Council and the new codification of it in 1983. Uh, canon law is an attempt to govern the Church, using both divine laws and human laws. The divine laws would be things like what the matter of the Eucharist is and things like that, and they're put in the code too. But they're also governed by human laws because, let's face it, I mean, we have a billion-person church. <laughs> There's no, no organization on earth in a way that's as large as the Catholic Church. And when you consider that this tiny little amount of bureaucrats at Rome basically govern it, you know, there have to be norms and whatever uh, for that government to take place. And it's a miracle, in a way, that the church has functioned as well as it has. Um, because, you know, we really didn't have a codification of canon law until 1917. That was the first one. And then in 1983, they kind of redid it. But uh, the best source, uh, there is a source uh, edited by Corridan, which is an American source, and not great, but not bad either. It gives you a lot of the background of why the canon is the canon, what it means, and it compares it with the 1917 code. Also, the Opus Dei uh, wrote a, co a commentary on the code of canon law, and that's pretty good too. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. Aaron writes in, If Jesus spoke in hyperbole so often, how do we know that he wasn't being hyperbolic when talking about his flesh and blood in the Eucharist? Oh, yeah, well, that's a famous old Protestant problem. Christ says he's a door. Is he a door? I am a door, etc. Well, first of all, I think the the majesty of the language in in both the original and in Greek is of such a character that it emphasizes that there he's speaking literally. And of course it also reflects John chapter six. Um, because Christ is very clear there. He who unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you shall not have life with you. And then, of course, the Jews object that he's recommending cannibalism. And the v verbs that Jesus uses for his body and blood there, he doesn't go back on. He makes them more vivid. Like he says, unless you chew, mm, you know, my flesh, etc., you have no life in you. Now, of course, he doesn't mean cannibalism. But the point is that uh, he's not talking about it metaphorically there. Uh, in the other cases... Um, well, I suppose it would depend on the context, yes. 
And Felix wants to know, will there still be a purgatory at the end of the world after the last judgment? No. After the last judgment, you, you, you ha heaven or hell. That's it. Um, purgatory will come to an end. Yeah. For one thing, there won't be anybody living on earth anymore on pilgrimage. So there's no need for purgatory to exist. How that will come about, I really don't know. I'm not sure it's uh, revealed in the scripture, except for the fact that Jesus pronounces the judgment publicly on all the living and all the dead, which would include the people in purgatory. And here, here's a nice uh, uh, specific question for you. Rose wants to know, which church teachings are mandatory according to the catechism? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> How about all of it? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, how many candles on the altar wouldn't be mandatory? But I don't think that's in the catechism. The, the purpose, and of course the catechism isn't totally exhaustive either of all the truths that we teach. Remember, it's a billion-person church. It's been in existence for 2,000 years. And if you include the Old Testament, what, 4,000 years? So there's a lot of water that's gone under the bridge and a lot of things that have been clarified as, as, as taught there. Now you remember in the old times uh, when they teach dogma, they used to try to grade the dogmas. So they had what was directly of faith, what was proximate to the faith, what was only piously taught, what was this, what was that. I mean, if you want to go through all that, it's fine. Um, but I, generally, I would say to deny the sacraments or to deny the creed, those are certainly mandatory church teachings. Uh, next up is Sergio in Rockville, Maryland, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Sergio, you are on with Father Milady. Hi, Father. I hope you're doing well. So um, my question is a very sensitive question. Um, throughout the history, um, the Catholics and Christians in general, like many other religions too, they committed some, uh, in my opinion, some horrific crimes. And just recently, there was all over the news uh, 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 the crimes uh, against their uh, native children in Canada, which Paul uh, publicly apologized for. So my question is why those people, they're so close to God and they preach the, the Word of God and they um, they should have so much goodness in them, but they, they still committed all these crimes. What's, what's the reason? How, how come this is happening? Well, if you're uh, I don't really know when it comes to uh, issues like, I must admit even I've been surprised at what seems to be the prevalence of things like pedophilia. Um, I live with people who apparently did that. I couldn't have told you they did it. They just looked just looked like everybody else. Why they would do that and their calling, I really don't know. People say it's because we have power over people, but I think that may have been used by people, but I don't think that's the reason they set out to do it, uh, to prove their power. I think it was because they felt lonely and they didn't understand celibacy, and I don't think it was explained to them, uh, the boundaries. And then when it was, they didn't. They rejected them, or they couldn't live with them. So um, that's my only explanation for that. What I would say, though, is that we have to be very beware of judging the past by the present. People do it all the time, and what in the one age was not considered extremely cruel, in our age might be considered extremely cruel. And strangely enough, what in our age we don't consider extremely cruel, like, for example, abortion, <laughs> or, uh, you know, uh, teaching people false teeth, destroying their faith, um, using psychological uh, um, um, intimidation, to get them to change their opinions. Uh, past ages would have considered terribly cruel. So it's very important not to judge one time, place in history and what meant something to them 
in the same way as you judge it today or vice versa. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Marion would like to know, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his divine self didn't die. How could his body and divinity be separated for three days? Well, the, the body is joined to his divinity, and don't forget his soul, right? Both were separated. Uh, the divine soul and the body aren't the divinity. Remember, they are joined by the person of the word in hypostatic union. So they did, he, both of them preserved their unity with the Godhead, in other words, the soul and the body, but they didn't preserve it with each other. And so the body went to limbo the just, and, and the soul went to the limbo the just, so the body went to the grave. And then when Christ rose from the dead again, they were reunited. But they weren't separated from the divinity, either one of them. Uh, but they were separated from each other. And so there was no human nature uh, for three days after the crucifixion. Um, if God is unchanging, then how could he change and become man, Joanne would like to know. Oh, that's, that's a very interesting question. And uh, according to St. Thomas, uh, nothing changes about God at all. What changes is the world. So before, we were called to be united to God in nature, and that's still the case for all the rest of us. But by a miracle, nature was united to God in person. That's why we call it the hypostatic union, the personal union of God uh, with nature. And this is a unique union, and it's also a, what the term that's used to describe it is a relation, because it doesn't uh, necessarily demand change on either side of the relation. So it's a new relation now. What before was joined to God only in nature, now becomes joined to God in person by a special grace. And finally today, John would like to know if the marriage of Mary and Joseph was valid since they didn't consummate it. Yes, that's the famous problem of the Josephite marriage. Uh, yes, it was valid because, remember, marriage is only considered to be not uh, a true marriage if you make it a condition that you'll never consummate your marriage. If you're open to it, that's all that's needed. So Mary and Joseph knew that God had revealed to them that they shouldn't consummate their marriage, but each gave their freedom up to God so that if he should ever reveal to them that their marriage should be consummated, they were willing to do that. Father, would you leave us with a blessing? May the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Brian Milady, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks so much for tuning in. Back at it tomorrow with Colin Donovan, our Vice President of Theology. Until we get